So I want to welcome everyone to our second um, preschool webinar um, with Donna. The first one was uh, amazing, and I don't think we should expect anything less with this one. Um, just <laughs> no a pressure, reminder. Thanks. That, <laughs> <laughs> just a reminder that we have one more um, coming up in May, uh, May fifth. Again, a Tuesday, three thirty, four thirty, our happy time. Um, so. If you're registered for this one, I'll send you the invite anyway, so you don't have to do anything. You'll just get the Zoom link in your mailbox automatically. Um, so I am going to pass over again. Um, I, I just assume Donna, that everybody knows you now because it's our <laughs> second one. But um, we have Donna Skeet from uh, Concordia University, who's our um, early childhood educator. Um, guru expert that's going to kind of give us some ideas about creating playful learning environments this session. Um, if you have any questions, um, just throw them in the chat and we'll have a few minutes at the end to ask any questions. And our next session will be looking at um, um, observation and evaluation kind of uh, theme, um, kind of following how the MEQ's program has been organized. So with that, Donna, um, have a wonderful session and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Great. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for inviting me um, to take part in these workshops. Um, uh, guru might be a little strong, but I appreciate that um, that, <laughs> that you think that of me. Um, I'm really excited about giving this workshop um, because I really believe in um, the role that learning environments have in, in helping us as educators, as teachers, um, uh, teach and learn and, and, and provide um, environments that, that, that children learn and explore and, and engage in. And so this is a really exciting one for me. Um, I've packed it full of all kinds of stuff. So if we don't get through it today, um, Chris has promised that he's going to send this PowerPoint and this recording to uh, everybody so that we can, you can watch it again um, and, and be able to pick up on all of this stuff. I've put out lots and lots of pictures and diagrams and stuff for you to be able to sort of get ideas of what I'm talking about. And so um, as we go through, again, throw as many questions as you want into the chat, and I will do my best to answer them at the end of this seminar. Um, but again, thank you so much for coming in and thank you for, um, you know, time is precious and I do appreciate that you are um, taking the time to come and learn about uh, playful learning environments. It is something that is yeah, near and dear to my heart as well. So first of all, let me just introduce myself a little bit um, so you know who I am and why I'm here. Uh, so again, my name is Donna Ski and I do have an MA from uh, uh, Child Studies at Concordia University. I am a Concordia grad. Um, I am also a qualified early childhood educator and I spent 10 years working in the field, uh, working with children from the ages of 16 months all the way up to four years old. And you will hear some of my stories today about my four-year-old experiences. And for the last 19 years, I have been a college professor at Vanier College. Um, I loved my experience there. I, I teach young adults to become early childhood educators. And as most of us in the educational system, uh, we are lifelong learners. I am a lifelong learner. I love going to workshops myself. I love learning more about this profession. I spend my time off in the summer going to workshops and reading about early childhood. I'm a little obsessed, um, but that's okay. This is one of the things that uh, makes uh, this uh, interaction so important for me because I feel like I have all of this information over my last 29 years in the field of early childhood to be able to come to you and help you through some of the, the challenges that you may have in your classroom. So, let's talk about the importance of the physical environment. Well, you know, I know it's not the beginning of the school year and, you know, it's kind of getting winding down, but I want you to kind of think about 
um, the physical environment throughout the year. It's not just set up your classroom in August or September and that's it, right? It is a living entity, it is evolving. And one of the things that we have to recognize that the importance of the environment is that we create a caring and equitable classroom community that is in, that's reflected in your intention as the educator. What is it that you want to portray? What are your important aspects? What do you want to teach? What do you want the children to learn in your environment? What is it that's important to you? And so we're gonna go through this whole process thinking about, okay, how do I create an environment? Reggio Emilia talks about the physical environment as the third educator. How do we create a classroom where we are the where we have a third educator, where children can just go into areas and they're learning and they're they're working through um, you know processes and building on their social skills and their emotional skills and their math skills and science skills without us always having to be there, but it's there in the environment. So educators intentionally set up these classroom environments to promote active learning through exploration and play. How, how do we do that? Through learning centers, through materials, through ideas, all of these things are really, really important for us to sort of think about before we even set up the classroom. And the thing that's interesting too, when we think about setting up our classroom in September, we don't necessarily know the children yet. We don't know who we have. We may see them on the piece of paper, but we don't know who they really are. So again, our classrooms need to evolve and to be able to make way for the children and their learning. So, and a big focus that we've really seen in the last couple of years, especially in the pandemic years, is that there needs to be a focus on mental health and physical health um, through how we set up the classroom, how children get to move. And we'll talk about that. Um, is there a place, a space where they can go and have a quiet time? Have you set up a book area where children can feel um, cozy and warm? Is there a place where children can just go quietly and, and spend some time instead of always being in the hubbub of, of a big classroom? So we have to think about the individual child and we have to think about the group of children when we're going through that. So the first thing that we need to talk about is classroom routines. Classroom routines are essential for keeping children on track. It is important, it's imperative that we have consistent and predictable classroom routines. And this helps to increase children's independence because they know what's gonna happen next. And it's their ability to, to anticipate change. So we know, you know, they know, okay, after we finish snack or after we do this, we're going on to go outside. And when we go outside, we're gonna come back. It's gonna be circle time, circle time, and then we may move on to something that has to do with music or, or gym or whatever, and then lunchtime. And like, there is a sequence of events that takes place consistently in your classroom so that children just know it's going to happen. And we need that to happen because children who are all over the place, we know that they will act up. They will misbehave. They will, the behaviors won't be there because they don't have that consistency. And it's important to recognize that transitions help with classroom organization. It allows children to be aware of what is happening in the moment and what's coming up next. And it's important for educators to include transitions in those classroom routines. And sometimes we have to be careful and know our children well enough to be able to give some children need transitions to the transitions. Like I used to have children that I needed to give the five minute warning before the five minute warning happened. So I would just go over and nicely to say to the child, you know, in five minutes, I'm calling five minutes. And that helps children to sort of switch gears and to move um, in a particular way where they're like, okay, something's coming up next. I'm able to do that transition. And we need to allow children that time to switch, to be able to move from one activity to the next and to sort of refocus their brain. Because sometimes they're really focused in their play and they don't want to stop. So we need to move on to whether it's lunchtime or circle time or some other activity. 
So we need to do that. And educators need to recognize that you cannot have lots of transitions when you're working with three and four and five and six years old uh, because they don't like to wait. Children who wait, usually you end up with uh, guidance issues because they get into trouble because there's too much wait time in between these transitions. So make sure you only have like a five minute window and move the children along as smoothly and as quickly as you possibly can. So very important to be able to establish those routines in an early childhood classroom. And in any classroom, right? The children just need to know. It's a sense of safety too, right? Um, it's important for educators to allocate extended period of time for play. Recognizing that children, um, when you're observing them, Especially when you think about something in the dramatic play. If you ever watch children in dramatic play, this is why I love this picture that I've used. When you see them in dramatic play, a lot of times it takes 15 or 20 minutes for them to establish the story of what they're going to play with before you even start the play. So children need that time to sort of establish themselves and then get into the whole idea of play and get into their story and get into that. So when you do have 30 and 40 and 50 minutes of, of, of free play, as, as they call it, free play, it's great because it gives children that opportunity to set themselves up, to figure out what they're going to play with, how they're going to establish it, which roles that everybody's going to have, and then they start into their activity, into their play. So we need to give them that, that time. So we need to allot at least you know, 30 to 40 minutes where children are allowed to just engage in that kind of play. And it helps them to get deeply involved and in, in a complex level, right? If you watch children in dramatic play or in the block area, they're really getting into their characters, their imaginations, the materials that they need. And when we stop it, and say, okay, time to move on to something else, you're taking away the opportunity for children to learn to focus, to engage, to move one step further in their play. So the longer that we give children that opportunity to engage in one area or in, in one you know, amount of time to play, it allows them to get into more and more complex play uh, situations, which is important and which is what we want. Um, and it's always important when we talk about classroom routines to allow, uh, to follow something that's consistent. So everybody, you know, free play snack, uh, you know, morning circle, you know, free play, you know, outdoor time, lunch time, you know, rest time, like it has to be consistent, but we also have to be flexible. Um, I always say to my, my students when I'm telling them about routines, we need to have a routine, but we don't necessarily have to be scheduled, right? It doesn't always have to be right at 12 o'clock because then we start rushing children along and they don't do well when we rush them along. We have to have the time management. They're the ones that have to have a little bit of flexibility. And if children are really super engaged, is it okay to let them go for a couple more minutes? Absolutely. You know, and giving them the time to clean up, giving the time to be responsible for the materials that they use. All of these things are really important. Routine is important, schedule is less so. And I know in a school situation, it might be a little bit more challenging to do that because there's other people that are coming in and who are working with different situations. But we kind of have to look at what the children need as well. Okay, so classroom routines are really something that we have to think about when we're thinking about our environment. Well, how about creating a learning environment? Well, educators who intentionally create spaces for wellness breaks, so being able to have children who can go off into a little corner that maybe has some pillows, um, you know, maybe a little tent, a little quiet area, so that they can take a break from the noise and the hustle and the bustle. We all need that, especially little children need that. It's, it's loud, it's noisy, it's busy. And not everybody is um, excited to be amongst everybody all the time, right? We all need a little bit of space sometimes. 
We need to set up a place where uh, we can have large group meetings. We can have little tables set up here, there for two people or four people, or you know, not necessarily desks, but more like tables where children can go and do their work. You know, and creating learning centers um, so that children have uh, places to go and that are specific to that, um, those materials. So a book area is very important in your classroom. I'm a lover of literacy and I believe that children uh, learn to love books through us and through the, how we set up our environment. So we want to create a warm and cozy book area uh, having quiet places for children to work independently. And what's very important for children to um, really feel like they belong in the classroom is that there's a designated space in the classroom, not necessarily in the puppies or whatever, but in the classroom that each child can have their own personal belongings. Maybe they brought to toys from home. Maybe they need a little stuffy at rest time. Maybe they have a blanket. Maybe they need something. They need to have access to that just in case. And maybe they don't need it at all that day, or maybe they don't need it at all, but it's nice to know that it's there. And it's important for them to feel like, okay, I can bring my stuff and it's okay. So we want children to feel like this is their classroom. This is really important for them. So I am a big believer in creating a yes rich environment. I think that we as early childhood educators and teachers need to say yes a heck of a lot more than we do. I think that uh, environments need to be set up in such a way where we are encouraging children to go get their own stuff. I love these two pictures of the two different classrooms. I know one, one seems very well kind of, you know, spaced out and the other one just has all kinds of great stuff. We want children to be able to go and get the tape and the glue and the scissors and the, and, and the materials that they need at any given point. We want to be able to say yes to the children so that when they, when they are you know, creating and using their imagination and their, it's not always no, and they realize and they feel like this is their classroom because it is their classroom. It belongs to them. So how do we create this? So saying yes to learning, I think this is so exciting. So a yes rich environment is about setting up your classroom to promote exploration. Saying yes as often as possible empowers children to make positive choices and have more control in their daily lives. And the story I wanted to, I want to share with you about this is that I, when I was working in the four-year-old, I had a group of children who decided, I don't know why, but they decided that where the kitchen area was in the corner, they didn't like didn't like it there. So they brought the, uh, they, they came to see me and they asked, they said, Donna, can we move the entire kitchen to the carpet area? Now I had this really big carpet area um, that was for circle time and nap time and all of this stuff. And I said to them, I said, yes, you can, but on one condition, you have to be able to move back all of the stuff at, at the end, like at cleanup time, because I need the carpet for nap time and for circle. And they're like, sure, no problem. So all five of them gathered up all of the kitchen and brought it to the carpet and spent 40 minutes playing in the kitchen on the carpet. So when cleanup time came, I gave them a little extra time. I went over to them. I said, in five minutes, we're going to be, I'm going to be calling five minutes, you know, because you're going to have to move everything back. No problem, that was day one. Day two comes along, they look at me and they ask, ah. I'm like, sure, <laughs> sure, let, let's do it again. So they brought it all back to the carpet and they started playing, great. I started to see a little bit of, it wasn't going so well. And so I went over and I said, you know, in five minutes, we're gonna be calling five minutes. And they were like, oh, like the idea of putting it all back is just a little bit too much. I said, would you like some help? 
And they're like, yes, <laughs> yeah, of course. So, so I lifted some of the heavier things and I brought it back and we set it all up and it was fine. Day three comes along. I'm at the art table. I'm helping children with other things. I notice out of the corner of my eye that the children are just playing in the corner. So I'm like, oh, they didn't move it today. I wonder why they didn't move it. So after I was finished in the art area and I was whatever, I, I sauntered over. I didn't make a big deal about it. I just sauntered over and I sat down in the dramatic play area. And I was like, oh, guys, you left the, the stuff here. Like, uh, what's going on? And with the drama or and the energy of a four-year-old, one of them turns to me and just says, oh my God, we're exhausted today. <laughs> I was like, okay. And one of the other children was like, yeah, we're gonna leave it where it is now. I'm like, okay. I never said no. I never allowed, I never took it over as it was my thing. I allowed them to learn the process to teamwork and to engage and, and to figure things out. That's what a yes rich environment looks like, you know? And that, you know, the children were very appreciative that I was helping them. They were very appreciative that I had said yes. I didn't intrude. I allowed the authentic learning to take place. There was lots of independence and it was the children's self-esteem and they chose, they made the decision whether to move it or not to move it. And I think when we hand, I don't wanna say hand over the environment to the children, but when we allow children to have a, just a little bit more control, they're really gonna surprise us. It was wonderful to see this whole thing going back and forth, back and forth. And so, you know, and they learned a lesson. After a while, the grass wasn't so greener on the carpet. They decided that they preferred just to stay where they were. So I, all of that to say is that it's very possible and you don't have to have a ton of stuff. It's just about your approach to, to, to the environment. So how do we create a yes rich learning environment? First of all, I'd like you to actually take a, a child tour of your classroom. Get down on the floor or crouch down to the level of your smallest pre-K or kindergarten child. And what do you see? What do you see in that environment? Do you see legs of, uh, of, of desks? Do you see the teacher's desk? Do you see materials that you can actually go and get? Do you see... Uh, your artwork? Do you see uh, pictures on the wall? Or is it all up here? How are children supposed to make decisions about what it is that they want to play with if they're constantly having to go to the teacher or the educator to ask what it is, you know, that they want to play with? Why can't it just be there? And I know a lot of you have this um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, not negativity, but more of a, uh, you know, not sure. Like, are they always going to take all of this material out? Children learn to monitor themselves. If they have access to tape all the time, they don't go super crazy with the tape. If they have access to scissors, they won't go crazy with the scissors because it's there. It's not something new, it's not something novel, it's right there. So get down to the level of your smallest pre-K and see exactly what they see. And is it a yes rich environment? Is it something that you know you would want to be at or where you would, would want to be if you were four years old? Is it inviting? Is it exciting? Can you get the stuff that you need in your classroom at that level? Or do I always have to ask the teacher? Secondly, we have to examine your comfort zone. So identify behaviors that you as the educator and the teacher are uncomfortable with. 
So on the flip side of that story, I was working with a cooperating educator as well, who has gone off and done planning. Um, and when she came back and saw that the, uh, that, the, that the kitchen area had been moved to the carpet, the poor, the poor girl, I thought she needed a paper bag. <laughs> freaking out like she's like what is that you know she had a totally different mentality of this is my classroom and this is what my classroom is supposed to look like whereas I had the mentality of this is their classroom and they can do what they want so obviously there was different philosophies going on there she managed to work through it and she allowed it to happen for a couple of days and I said just watch just watch and let's see what happens and I'm happy that she allowed me that opportunity to let the children do what they needed to do to work it out their system, uh, work it out of their system, to be able to try new things, to be able to be engaged, and and then in the end it went right back to where it was, and everybody was fine. But what are you? Some of the things that irk you? Do you not like loud noises? Do you not like too many children in one space? What about mess? Do we have a, do we, are we challenged by mess when the classroom starts to get dirty or it starts to get messy? Do we start to get like, no, 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 we have to clean up. But this is something that you yourself have to sort of work through. The idea of too many children in one space, maybe that's because your, your space isn't big enough. If you have six children in a dramatic uh, place and you know, on the wall it says four, you know, I've seen educators go and grab children out of there. But what I've said before is children have spent 15 or 20 minutes coming up with these grand scenarios. Now you've just taken out two key players. So instead of thinking that the space is ha, has too many children, maybe the space is too small for the children that want to be in there. Let's flip it around. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Maybe we make something a little smaller somewhere else and we, we create a dramatic play area that six children can go in. We create a block area where there's eight children in there. Maybe your book corner needs to have you know, six pillows. Thinking about how we can create it so we don't have to say no. One of the things that we struggle with is number three. We have to watch and wonder. We are so good as adults in problem solving for children. And sometimes we need to take a step back and watch what happens before you intervene. Because you'd be surprised how well children can problem solve, especially in the four and five and six year old figure out what it is that they're trying to figure out and just let it happen. If they turn to you and say, hey, can you come and help us? Absolutely. But sometimes it's okay just to watch. And it's okay to wonder with the children. I'm talking in my classes right now, we're talking about science in spring. And it's a wonder. Every day there's something new outside that's happening and it's exciting. And let's say yes to that. Ask open-ended open questions as the observer. What's going on here? Can you talk to me about you know, what you're, you guys are playing about? We're building on their language, building on their memory, building on their, their ideas and their imagination. We have to figure out how to create this wonderful environment for the children. So one of the things is be active and engaged. Like I said in my story, I just went in and sat in the dramatic play area. I have to say though, in all of my years and 10 years of working as an educator, my children are so used to giving me imaginary cups of tea. So it's just an automatic thing, but not being intrusive. Don't barge into their play, just quietly sit there and see what they're talking about. Ask questions. See what they have to say. Become a partner in their play. Don't become part, don't become overbearing and in the play. Don't problem solve for them. Don't engage in anything that might alter their play. Just stay the course and just see what they're doing. And have fun, oh my goodness. 
yes, rich environments are fun for us too. I know as early childhood educators and teachers, we don't wanna say no all the time. We want to have fun. We want to say yes. We want children to feel that they can explore and feel free to play and to be able to uh, you know, cross pollinate um, materials from different areas of the classroom. The other day I was supervising in a, in a, in a daycare classroom in a four or five year old classroom. There was two boys that went in the dramatic play. One of them put on the Elsa dress. The other one put on the Anna dress, headed into the block area and started to play with blocks and trucks. It's okay for these things to take place. Enjoy it. It's fun. We're, the whole foundation of four and five in pre-K and kindergarten is to teach children the joy of learning so that later on, they're still enthusiastic and they're still engaged and they still want to be there. Take pleasure in your time that you have to play with the children. Relish in the wonder and excitement that comes from learning together. And I think once we sit, switch our mindset to allowing or uh, thinking about the classroom as their environment and, 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 and children have a say in what happens and what they do and, and the materials that they bring out and, and what they bring into the different areas, you're going to see some great creativity, some wonderful imagination, and you're going to see children learning in the most fantastic ways. So I want you, I challenge you to work on a classroom that allows children, allows you to say yes to this, to their environment, say yes to the materials that they want to play with, say yes to how they want to engage. It's really very important for children's learning. So what is a developmentally appropriate environment for pre-K and kindergarten children? So we're gonna talk about um, different activity or learning centers. This is very important. Um, I know that most of you are coming from a classroom setting and a classroom setting involves having desks, having a teacher's desk, having um, a little bit more structure. Whereas I'm coming from a place where no, I've never, never in my career ever had a teacher's desk in the classroom. I've never had a desk in the classroom. Uh, you know, small tables, ch uh, chairs that are appropriate sizes for the children. Um, you know, being able to move the table around, move the tables out of the way if we're going to do a gross motor experience, if we're going to do some dancing or we're going to move around, you know, that kind of thing. Having learning centers that you know, uh, evolve and, 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 you know, engage the children as they are growing, helps children to work and play independently, either within small groups or in the large classroom community. Learning centers offer experiences that support children's fine motors, gross motor, like this writing area, you know, working on children's writing skills. I mean, I love this picture because it has post-it notes. Don't tell me as a, a teacher, we don't love, and educators, we don't love post-it notes. So do four-year-olds, they love post-it notes, you know, working on language development, on literacy and problem solving skills. And being able to incorporate into our classrooms things that are individually and culturally familiar materials that make the curriculum come alive for children while introducing them to, you know, a, a, a diversity of materials, you know, like pencils and pencil crayons and markers and resources that can be used. None of you should have a full recycling bins. All of your recycling should be coming into your, into your classroom for children to use in the art table. These are all great resources for you to be able to use. Dragging boxes down the street and bringing boxes into your classroom and, and having all of these kinds of materials for children to be able to engage in and to figure out exactly what it is that they want to build with all of these materials. So I wanna just talk a little bit about a, a few separate areas. Um, the art area. <clears throat> now, the art area for me has always been an area that I've always um, valued and treasured. I think 
every single classroom should have an art area. It also should have an easel for children to be able to create and use their imagination individually, or if you can, side by side, all of those are wonderful experiences. Having materials out for them to be able to create, you know, tongue depressors and popsicle sticks and pom-poms and googly eyes and you name it, have it all out there for them to be able to create whatever it is that they want to create. And I always tell my students over and over again, get rid of the chairs at the art table. Children want to stand and for children to be able to really focus and to engage, have them stand at the art. And one of the things that I really wanted to bring to light um, uh, when I was, you know, talking, making the connections for me as a college professor and, you know, talking to you guys, um, I wanted to talk to you about, you know, this, this little picture in the corner right here about uh, the Crayola colors of the world. I teach a course at Banyan College called Diversity. Uh, diverse, diverse populations in early childhood settings. And I had a wonderful conversation, kind of sad, but kind of a wonderful conversation with my students. And they were telling me how they remember, you know, my students of color were telling me how when it came time to draw pictures of themselves, of their families, there was no color for them they had to use, you know, tree trunk brown and like midnight black, which is not the color of their skin. Um, and they always felt like there wasn't a connection there for them at the art table. They weren't able to find the right color for their skin tone. And so drawing pictures of their family, drawing pictures of themselves was never a, a positive experience. And I thought, well, I can, I can at least bring that kind of information to you guys. It's as simple as buying a box of crayons and having every shade out there for children to be able to draw a picture of themselves so that they can feel connected, so that they can feel part of the classroom. Hey, this crayon is the same color as my skin. And if you know anything about families and, and how diverse families are right now, you know, the whole, you know, a, a whole family could be a completely different. Every single one of them could be a different shade on that picture. But to be able to have that connection, and interestingly enough, my students, 18, 19, 20, 24 years old, still remember not having a crayon that suited their skin tone. So I wanted to bring that message to you guys to say, hey, you know, they remember, they know, and it's important for us. And I don't think we did, anybody did this intentionally. And I'm so happy to see that Crayola has come up with these skin tone uh, uh, crayons. And I'm sure they can get them in pencil crayons and markers and whatever. But this is, this is so very important to make this connection so everybody feels that they are equal parts of the community that we are establishing in our classroom. So keeping that in mind, when you are sending out materials, when you are asking children to draw pictures of their family, of to draw pictures of themselves, it's so very important that they can see a crayon or a pencil crayon or a marker that connects to them. Now the block area, now I love the block area. I think the block area is so versatile. You can have so much materials. We talk a lot about loose parts. Um, I hope that uh, you guys are like me. <laughs> My office is full of all kinds of materials that I have found and gathered over the years. Um, pine cones and rocks and marbles and, and tubes and boxes and, and sticks and twigs and uh, anything that you can see. Like a, a block area doesn't have to be just about the blocks. You can, have, um, you can have animals, you can have people, you can have cars, you can have trucks. I mean, I love the picture in the middle, upper middle, where there's baskets and picture frames and pillows and 
I mean, allowing children just to cross pollinate and to be able to bring in all kinds of materials, we see children's imaginations, we see children's ability to, to uh, create, you know, villages and, and, and forests and, and, and all kinds of different things out of this, these, you know, block areas and, and using their creativity and using their imagination to be able to connect all of these um, important parts of, of learning in, in the block area, in that, in, uh, you know, center. And this is one of the centers that should be your largest area, right? We want children to have space. And, you know, most of the time, <laughs> funny most of the time it ends up leaving the area right sometimes it gets looped around the table sometimes it gets looped around you know different areas that's okay that's all part of the learning they're, they're they're figuring out they're talking about space they're they're thinking about how many that they can use you know and you know children if given out of adequate, adequate time will be able to come and clean it all back up and that's where we have our transitions, right? So that's really important. And one of the things I wanna to talk to you about, and I, I, I went to a workshop on this and I thought, oh, this is so wonderful. I wanted to bring this to you. Talking about the physicality of play. You know, pre-K and kindergarten children are physically into their play and they are in the concreteness of their play. And educators and teachers need to approach children's interests from a completely different angle. And I love this approach. You know, instead of taking a topic and thinking about it in the noun, you know, let's turn it into a verb. How do we turn it into a verb? A noun, we think, you know, if you ask a parent, oh, my child likes trains. Good example, right? Trains. Educators need to think of the physicality, what is the physicality of playing with the train? You know, the verb is moving the train and hitching up the train and attaching the train and, and moving it all through the classroom. These are the physicalities of a topic. And as early as educators, as teachers, we have to think not just as the topic. Yes, we can have books about trains in our uh, in our book corner and we can have pictures of trains, but what is the physicalness of a train? How do we move like a train? How do we, you know, set up a whole train set in, and make it physical and, and concrete so that children are learning through movement, through their concreteness. They need to be able to touch it, to feel it, to figure it out, to be able to learn. And that's why it's so very important for us to sort of switch our mindset and think about play in that physical sense and in that concrete sense. And so as we're moving through our topics, as we're thinking about setting up our environment, how can we set it up so that children are moving and hitching and attaching and thinking about it in a verb sense? so that children are getting that movement at the same time. Movement equals learning. Loose parts, I love loose parts. Loose parts help children develop creative and critical thinking skills that encourage children to use imagination and to experiment with new material. I love all of this stuff, you know, uh, you know, someday soon, instead of going to like uh, um, uh, like a, a Toys R Us to buy our children toys, we should be going to like the the to Rona or Patrick Mohey or you know to be able to pick up pieces of wood. Uh, you know, I've stopped people on the road and asked them for like small pieces of wood that they have cut. You know, just gathered up a few things like that. I've you know dragged the box down the street. I've you know, found tubing, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff that, that I can take into the lab nursery for them to be able to, to engage with and add, you know, boxes become so many things, 
you know, pieces of wood add, you know, and they're not always equal. And so children have to, you know, figure out balance and understand how physics works. And, and like all of this great stuff that takes place when we think about loose parts. So we can have big loose parts where we can have it, you know, like the, the ladder that we see on the, on the left, but we can also have smaller pieces that help children add to the block area or add to, uh, add to their play. You know, I love to see loose parts out in the playground too. I think that also helps children to really work on their, their, their physical, um, uh, you know, problem solving skills, going back to the idea of physicality and play and, and, and playing as a verb, you know, how do I, how do I do this? And sometimes, you know, it's too big, they have to go over and ask somebody for help. There's a lot of stuff that happens when we, when we ask children to, um, to, to play with, with the material that has, uh, you know, no actual beginning or end to it. They can do whatever they want. And they usually do, which is amazing. Now, dramatic play is a very important part of your classroom environment um, because you know it's 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 a place where children work on their social skills. They work on their roles. Um, they work through things that they have to deal with. Like uh, in the dramatic play area, I've seen uh, educators who have turned. Um, you know their dramatic play into things like um, like vets when the dog when when a child's dog had to go to the vet or to the dentist, which can be a little scary for young children when they have to go to the dentist for the first time. Uh, you know, thinking about flower shops and you know, and there's so much rich learning that takes place in dramatic play. If you set up a grocery store or you set up a flower shop, or you set up, you know, you can put in the cash register, you can have them talking about money, you, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you're doing a whole thing on economics, you know, you're talking about, you know, uh, the exchange of goods, and, you know, children all know how to go to the grocery store, and they all know how to tap, they've all learned that, they've seen their parents do that many, many times. And one of the things that's really important about dramatic play and the teacher's role in dramatic play is again, going back to the idea of the intervention. You know, we don't wanna to intervene too much. We wanna sit there, we wanna to listen to what children have to say, but it's also a good opportunity as the educator to sort of model, you know, model for children how to enter into play. I'm sure you guys have come across children in your experience where they kind of bull in a china shop, come in and start taking over the toys and, and, and grabbing and all of a sudden the play is not as positive as it once was. Well, that's a child who doesn't know how to enter into play. And it's important for us as an, as an educator, as teachers, to model that because children don't necessarily know that. This is a skill that is learned, not a skill that they have automatically um, been born with. It's not innate. So we can model how to enter into play, how to sit there and to ask questions and to enter into the play and, and be part of that excitement of, of the roles, take on a role, just a secondary role, but still, we're still there. And we hear what they have to say. If anybody has ever sat in a dramatic play, you can hear some very interesting stories about, you know, children on their cell phones and having all these conversations and, and talking and, and all kinds of stuff. They are working through their life. They're figuring out the roles that they play. And that's why when we have dramatic play centers, it's really important that we, we, we think about how big it is, um, you know, what materials we're going to put in there, um, how we're going to set that up. Because it does give children the opportunity to try out different things. They come up with different scenarios. If we always have the kitchen, it's always the same scenario. But if we move things around and, you know, I, you know, as examples, I put in a grocery store, a flower shop. Uh, I personally like the camping, you know, children sitting around the campfire and, and talking about different things at the campfire. Having lots of materials in your kitchen. 
things that are culturally appropriate for your children in your group. How many of you have, you know, uh, Chinese bowls and chopsticks? How many of you have a, you know, a mortar where they can they can work on on you know uh, you know crushing uh, herbs and things like that? How many of you have different materials that you've found over the course of time that 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 can be authentic in your dramatic play that children really can make that connection? I was I was in a dramatic play area I was supervising, and one of the children was looking for the Keurig. They wanted to press down the Keurig because that's what they know how to make coffee. Like they don't know how to put the kettle on. They know how to make coffee by pressing down on the Keurig and making coffee. Like these are all things that children make those connections with. This is what they see. This is their, this is their life. And this is how they make um, those positive things. So so the dramatic play is something that we should always have. Book corners. I love having a book area. Reading areas are so very important. Setting up a, an area that children feel um, connected to. It's a quiet space. Um, you can have it theme-based, or you can just create a space where children feel that they have a place to go, just to sit quietly, to look at books, to engage. To, to just enjoy the love of, of books. And I always tell my students all the time, you don't always have to have um, fiction books. I think children love those big, you know, National Geographic nonfiction books where they have great pictures and children will sit together and look, you know, they love sharks, they love dinosaurs, they love all of these, you know, great things, the ocean, you know, to be able to look and see all of these uh, great pictures that we can come across and give them a time just to rest and to pause and to learn, you know, a little bit of um, self-regulation in the book corner and connecting it to a positive thing. We want children to love books. And this gets me to circle time. So circle time is a great opportunity for children to build on their social and emotional skills, right? Using circle time, you know, I'm going to say something controversial. I'm sorry, and I'm, I know I'm running out of time, but, you know, the whole idea of calendar and, and it, 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 the research shows that children only understand time and calendar in, at eight years old, and yet we're doing it in the four and five-year-old, uh, with the four and five-year-old. They don't get it. They don't understand. They don't know what you know, if we go back to the physicality, we go back to the concreteness, what does an April 5th feel like? You know, Monday has a feeling, Friday has a feeling, but I don't know if April 5th has a feeling, you know, can they really understand that? So let's think about circle in a different way. Let's discuss what's coming up that day, what new materials you brought in, what you want to talk about. Maybe you saw something that evening that you want to bring in and talk to the children about. Maybe something happened in class that you want to bring up, you know, and you give children the opportunity to share and to build on their language skills and to be able to stand up in front of their peers and have a conversation and talk about, you know, what it is that's going on in their lives or whatever topic that they want to discuss. You know, bring up issues that are happening in the classroom. We all know sometimes children, you know, don't always share or they don't always want to play with certain children. And these are opportunities for us to really help children understand, you know, like you don't always have to be friends with everybody, but you do have to be kind. So having those kind of things. And to sing, oh my gosh, we all need to sing way more than what we're doing. I know everybody goes, oh, I have a terrible voice. I have a terrible, terrible voice too, but I love to sing. And do the and do gross motor experiences doing your circle time. And you know, I don't know how old or how young you all are here, but you all know how to do the hokey pokey. So come on, get up, move, get the children moving, jumping around, excited to be in your classroom that day and to read really good books, which promotes the love of reading, it promotes language, open dialogues about topics that are discussed in books. 
And I know I'm running out of time, but I just want to get to my reading list. And I just, these are some of my favorite books. And if you can just pick a few of them, one of my absolute favorite books is one by Catherine Otashi. It is the simplest um, book with the greatest message. And it, it chokes me up every single time I read it. And I've read it many times, even to my CJEP students. They love it. It's all about it only takes one to make a difference. And I think that's really an important message. You know, two, same author, talks about, you know, the dynamics of friendship, which we all know happen in four and five-year-old classrooms. You know, children don't always know how to negotiate and navigate through all of this. The book with no pictures. Oh, my goodness. If you haven't read this book, your face will be red and you will be making all kinds of weird noises. The children will love it. Um, I love the book All Are Welcome because it is a, it is a book that um, uh, the illustrations are fabulous and every single person is included in this book. Every child will see themselves in this book. I love Paper, Paper Bag Princess. If anybody knows me, you know I love the ending where she goes off into the sunset with her big hair and her, and her paper bag and says, Fooey to the prince and 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 just lives happily ever after. Talking about Mortimer, Mortimer brings in so much into uh, you know the classroom dynamics. Bang bang rattle bang bang. I'm gonna make my noise all day. I mean, this gets the children involved in the stories. Going on a bear hunt, you can do so many story reenactments with this through the. Um, through the school, being able to do that. And all you need at the end is one brown bear stuffy. And children love going on a bear hunt. The Kissing Hand is a wonderful book that you can read in September and October um, about children missing their parents and how important it is to have a little kiss on their hand so that whenever they're feeling sad, um, they can go and um, uh, feel the warmth of their mother's love and it's really a great book for any child who's having se separation anxiety. And Pig the Pug, if you have children in your classroom with a great sense of humor, you have to read Pig the Pug. He, it's just the most hilarious thing I've ever read. So I just wanted to get to this point. I know that I've gotten right to 4.30. I'm going to leave the rest of my uh, PowerPoint uh, that will be sent to you, uh, but I will stop share and I, you know, if there's any questions or any comments or anything that anybody wants to share, um, I'm more than willing to stick around to, uh, to engage in any conversations that you want to have. I hope that you have enjoyed this um, information. I hope that this information has helped you. I, um, I, I love talking about the physical environment. And Chris and I have a few uh, uh, tricks up our sleeves next year. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll, be able to, uh, we'll be able to do some of this stuff in person and we'll be able to engage more and we can talk more about um, this topic. I'm sorry, Chris, I feel like I've gone a little crazy. <laughs> you did amazing, loved it. Um, really, really great stuff there. I'm still thinking about the third educator, you know, the classroom yeah. environment as a third educator. Like we had a comment too in the chat about the circle time, what you just talked about and that they really felt that they were in a good direction with their circle time. Cause it happens every day, right? Circle time, something very uh, daily that happens with the kids. I also really love this idea of the child tour of getting down to the level of student to see what they see never thought about you know but we always you know we're creating environments for the kids so it's really a lot great 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 idea and yeah, the hokey I, think, pokey, I think it's I so mean, important because we don't see that right we don't see like, we look up you know we look yeah. up and what does it look yeah. like what does it look like to a four-year-old do they yeah. go around all day like this oh wow this is really cool for adults <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely well there's lots of great ideas that you threw out there for us lots of great seeds that i'm sure will sprout um and i want to thank you donna again for just um 
some great words and reflection um, with our community. Um, well, I really do appreciate it. I think that again, you know, I've always said this to you, Chris, and you know, we've talked about this with the play committee. Um, you know, there needs to be more connection between uh, early childhood education and the early years in, in primary school. I really do think that, you know, if we can, we can really make those connections. I think that, you know, if we have a, it'll create a smoother transition mm -hmm. for the children. It will provide, you know, the, the, uh, the teachers with an idea of where we're coming from. It, like there's so many, you know, we should be working together. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Well, Anne uh, made a comment in, she said, why don't we make these classes more like this in cycle one as well? And I'm like, yes. So absolutely. Anne and I are going to have a talk down the road and we'll, we'll figure out how we can bring that in a little bit more. Absolutely. So, I think I think these are the kinds of things that, you know, uh, at least in grade one, if not in grade two, we should be able to create environments where children are still learning through yep. play, through yep. that physicality, through that idea of turning things into a verb. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love the idea of the hands involved. I'm a big hands guy, you know, we're getting kids hands moving and if it connects with them as well and they get their brain going, I mean, you got learning going on right there. So mm -hmm. the perfect, you know, the perfect storm thing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that perfect storm for learning. Well, you're getting lots of thank you, Stona, in the chat. Well, thank um, you. Honestly, guys, I'm so grateful for you guys for showing up. I know you do this on your own time and it's so appreciative. Um, thank you. And I hope I really, my, my wish, I know this is not a good week to say this, but my wish is that one day that we will be able to see each other in person and be able to do um, workshops together. I would love to set up an entire environment for you guys to be able to play in so that you can really feel what it's like um, yeah. and to, to experience that idea. kind of classroom. <laughs> That's a great idea. Anyway, we're going to be talking, Donna, and but we do have one more session, guys. There's still one on May 3rd. Uh, please come back. I'll send you the link regardless so that you'll get the recording as well um, if you can't attend. But attending's great. This is really fun to just kind of sit back and listen to your stories and reflect on all the different things that you were mentioning. So again, thank you, participants. Thank you, Donna, for your continued support on our preschool journey, mindset journey. I think it's going very well so far. <laughs> And um, we look forward to seeing you guys on May 3rd for our final um, of this series. So have a wonderful night, everyone.